not in the uh, habit of making, uh, not in the habit of making what are called value judgments. You, you merely try to explore, as you've said. Uh, but you hinted a moment ago that perhaps all innovation wasn't good and could be oh, resisted. I should, I, I myself, I'm uh, rather impressed by the limits of human beings and their powers to cope with innovation. And I, I really think, you, you'll find if you look back in human history, that most innovations were killed off at once, at birth. It is possible successfully to resist innovation, is it? I, it's very strange to... Uh, I, I have encountered over and over again the assumption in my readers that anything I describe, I must approve of. If it is there and if it is happening, it must be good. Otherwise, they wouldn't know how to value it. Is this an evolutionary uh, idea of progress, that any change is part of evolution and must be progress? I wonder. I'm really baffled. I don't pretend to know the answers, but I've been called, for example, I make my living, as it were, and my whole vocation out of the book. I've been called the enemy of the book because in the Gutenberg Galaxy, I describe how the book is being changed and modified by electric technology, perhaps superseded. I don't consider this a desirable thing, but mere fact that the mere fact that it's happening seems to occur to many people as value judgment. I'm baffled. I, 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 uh, perhaps some of your audience will offer some explanations of why people would tend to assume that anything that happens in the way of innovation or development must be uh, to our advantage. Is there, is there some kind of religious belief implicit in that? Do you I think? don't know, although Lynn White, strangely enough, in his book, Machina Ex Deo, the idea of technology as born of God himself, uh, argues, and I, as far as I know, he's the only person who does, that it is Christianity alone that has made technology possible in our Western sense, that only a very optimistic view of man and his development would have permitted the kinds of extreme innovation that we have developed in, say, the past thousand years. That uh, his, his view is that medieval technology, which is the beginning of modern science and so on, could only have been possible under the extreme optimism of Christianity, that all pagan cultures would have frowned upon it very early. This, this has something to do with the belief in the perfectibility of uh, human nature, I suppose. Partly it? perfectibility, also the idea that man deserves to be relieved from all the burdens possible by his own powers. Any of his powers are good. Anything he can do with his own powers to make life more livable is good. This is not a doctrine acceptable in other cultures which take a much dimmer view of human activity. And the pagans, the, the, uh, the ancient Greeks and Romans, wouldn't have uh, for a moment entertained this idea. I'm very interested, Professor McLuhan, to hear you say that uh, innovation is resistible, because uh, most of us, as far as our educations have gone, are given the example of the smashing of machines and uh, mills and that kind of thing, no. which didn't stand in the way of the Industrial Revolution, for example. and. Um, you refer, or I referred, you referred to the SST. One of the arguments put forward for it, I'm not going to ask you about the SST, is that it is going to be built. There is a mm -hmm. built-in assumption that the SST will be created. If it can, be, be, built, created, if if it it can, can be, be built, it, it ought to be built. This is the strange equation. Yes. If, any, if something can be done, it ought to be done. This is a very weird... I think perhaps this is where the atom bomb uh, brought people into a paradox. It could be done and suddenly it seemed very undesirable. Uh, wasn't it uh, Einstein's uh, feeling that he would have been better to have spent his life as a plumber? I think he said somewhere in his autobiography that if I had my life to live again, I'd be a plumber. I, I, it seemed it was as if he was reflecting upon the misfortune of having discovered how to split the atom. But, uh, yes, I think in the ecological age, we are going to um, ruthlessly prune out uh, innovation if it threatens um, the balance of uh, human powers and cultural uh, interchange. We're now living in the electric age, are we? But most of us don't realize it. Is that correct? The age of instant information as a total surround.
as a new cliché. You see, fish, uh, uh, it's um, not my invention, but uh, someone said, I, we don't know who discovered water, but we know it wasn't a fish. People never are aware of the things that are totally surround them, and hence the clichés of technological environment are invisible. The emperor's new clothes are always invisible. Except to little children, or, or kibitzers of that type who are outside the game, who will come in from outside the culture and are not prepared to accept its assumptions, perceptually or otherwise. Uh, so today, there isn't any game at all that doesn't have kibitzers coming in from outside the game, from other cultures. And so this um, is perhaps one of the causes of our self-awareness. When you have a surround of instant information, which is electric information, you have a situation surely unknown to human beings in any previous age. It means the end, for example, of subjects. When you have instant access to all information simultaneously, you can't have subjects. Children know this instinctively in the schools. You can't have jobs. You can only have roles. A job is a specialist activity with a fixed boundary. And in a resonant, simultaneous world of auditory space, you, will not, you cannot retain these fixed boundaries. So jobs are out. People prefer role playing. There is a, by the way, an, uh, uh, this might, since there's a movie coming along uh, called uh, Cromwell, it may have some bearing. Cromwell, in relation to Charles I, represented the application of the new print technology to military affairs, his Ironsides. And he had no trouble scrapping the old royalty, but he was unprepared for the retrieval. It's one thing to scrap, turn into camp or old hat, uh, some recent thing, but usually when you scrap something recent like that as print did when it scrapped the scribe and the scholastic philosopher, there is always a, another kick or flip, a retrieval, a sudden return of something long forgotten. It happened with us electrically with the coming back of horoscopes, ESP, and the occult. In the um, age of Cromwell, what came back with the destruction of monarchy was the saint. The royal martyr was transformed into a saint. And the uh, highly religious uh, society of Cromwell's time, Puritan society, was not prepared to entertain a royal martyr, a sudden retrieval from primitive Christianity. Well, could that have been avoided if the king's head had not been cut <laughs> off? It was that a practical matter? Or I don't know. I've never heard the matter raised before. But, you know, Hamlet was somewhat in this position. One of the reasons why Hamlet, Fortinbras, the strong man, comes marching on the stage. Poor Hamlet. He was an ideal prince, but medieval style. Loyal, devoted, and fun-loving, an actor loving uh, the profession of acting and the games of acting, but utterly unprepared for the serious grim business that Fortinbras and his efficiency experts were bringing onto the scene. Hamlet was suddenly out of a job with the print. Not Wittenberg, but Gutenberg finished off Ham Hamlet. He was scrapped and thrown on the junk heap by Fortinbras, the Cromwell of his time. The idea of marching in even rows was a startling and uh, innovation of that time, an irresistible thing. It, even in Napoleon's time, it was considered uh, a radical uh,